All right, we're ready when you are. IBC 2023, Udi Tiroj, DIY Photography. I'm here with Ted Sim, president of Aperture. How's it going? Good, good, Ted. How are yeah. you doing? I'm good. Can't complain. It's good to be back. Good to be here with you. So, so is that your first show after college? Or? Ooh, oh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I took, a, I took a departure for two years. I was never totally gone. I was still, you know, doing calls every week with the team. But um, took some time to really dive into the research, all the LED stuff. I, I now know... Too much random information. How much How much sleep have you had uh, last week? It was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. No, so I've, I've been back um, for about three months now with the team nonstop. We haven't done like a, a big announcement of me being back, but a lot of really exciting stuff to work on, a lot of change that's been coming out. So, yeah. big news from Aperture. Uh, you've just acquired ProLeft. We did. That's right. Um, tell me a little bit about this. Yeah, um, so, uh, so Mitch is incredible. And the ProLeft team is incredible. So we first came into uh, contact with him around NAB 2021. Uh, you know, obviously point source LED is our thing. We've been doing it for a long time. Uh, they came with point source RGB ACL, which is their big thing. And basically the big thing that we realized around NAB 2021 is that the two teams actually work together really well in a lot of ways. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but actually a couple members of the ProLight technical team originally came from Aperture, which is fantastic and it's great. And they're back in the family. You're getting them back. It's fantastic. But then also I think um, as far as like the, the technical team goes and Mitch, there's kind of like a philosophy that's really similar as far as, you know, I think this industry has a lot of like faceless corporations. That's not what Aperture is. We're here, we engage with the community. One of our biggest kind of company values is that, look, we're, all of us are filmmakers, but if we're working on the tech every day, we're not on the front lines anymore. And on the front lines, things are changing. So, I mean, you do news, you know, it changes so fast. So I think one of our big things is that no matter what the user needs, they're the expert at the end of the day. And it's our job to decipher what they need, help make their day easier, and that's how we work. So you've mentioned technology, and I want to you know, um, Aperture was doing RGB for us, still are doing yeah, RGB. Yeah, absolutely. And now we're the, we're the heads of it. We're the best of color size. The ACL. Yes, indeed. And I remember in that specific yeah. Yeah. NAB, there was a huge debate. No, Which one is better? I didn't love how that checked out, to be honest. <laughs> so yes. can you, just yeah. for our audience who's not that familiar, can you sure. dive a little bit into the technology and explain yeah. what are the differences between RGB you want me to explain the real differences oh my god i'm more than happy to i'm more than happy to okay, we can so, go only one level down okay i'll go one level down i would love to do a full technical presentation sometime we can bring in some color research scientists we can bring in tim kang who's the head of the ac lighting committee we can bring in mitch as well too to talk about rgb acl okay so basically when it comes to leds they're all made using the blue push emitter, right? So the blue push emitter is the, the thing that gets put and covered with phosphor that fluoresces the light. I'm getting too technical already. Yeah, so basically what you're saying that in essence, all yes. LEDs are blue. They are the, Bluish. the majority of LEDs that we use use the blue push LED emitter that's covered with phosphor that fluoresces into a different color and fills out that spectrum, right? Um, the main thing to understand though is that RGBWW maximizes the blue push emitter. So that's why you get maximum brightness out of it. Also, in a lot of the research that we've been doing, by using RGBWW, we're able to get better white point matches. So better SSI scores. If you don't know what SSI means, it basically means when you're trying to match daylight, the sun, or like a tungsten source, like an incandescent bulb, or like a fire, that means that our LEDs, again, are gonna be able to match those and get you better spectral recreations, better color. Not, not just in the sense yeah. of uh, color yes. temperature, right? Yes. But just like yes. filling the entire spectrum. And yes, I'm so happy I can white. talk to someone else who understands LEDs. <laughs> Do you understand how hard it is to explain? Okay, anyways, so that's RGBW. Yes, you get it. You understand it. Okay, so that's RGBWW. That's one way you can mix and make different colors in the spectrum, right? RGB ACL, now again, we're using different, no white chips. We're mixing them together to get the impression of white. Fantastic, you're gonna get more saturated colors because you get LEDs that are entirely dedicated to that color. But what that also means is that when you mix them together, your SSI scores are not gonna be as high. So again, it's not gonna match your daylight or your tungsten sources as well. That's a difficult thing to do. So both of them have their own advantages, right? And I think the big discussion from that year was like, which one is better, right? And RGB ACL, I'm just gonna say, it has better superior finesse when it comes to cleaning out those colors. You get more saturated colors. And again, the, I'm gonna, let's, this is the other thing too. This is the reason why I'm so impressed with ProLight is that the color mixing algorithm that it takes to mix a bunch of different non-white whites into white, insanely difficult. 
Right, because you can't just take green, white, and red. Uh, I'm sorry, green, blue, and red. No. It looks white, but the camera doesn't see it, it doesn't as white. It doesn't see it as white. And that's why... Okay, people love cameras, right? Here's the thing, your camera is only capable of shooting the light that it receives, right? So you got a light that shoots out a bunch of photons that bounce and fluoresce and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And then you got the camera that's the vacuum that sucks it all up. And I feel like we spend so much time thinking about camera color science, and then we use horrible lighting. And it's like, it's a little bit like data. It's like garbage in, garbage out. You need both to be good. I remember this from the hi-fi day, right? If you yes. get like a superior system, but your cables were crap, you would still grab crappy sound. exactly what it is. And like, when you think about bad fluorescent lighting or bad LED lighting, it's, it's actually, like I tell this to the team because sometimes it's like motivational to me. It's like, we were content with living in a low CRI TLCI world, right? And like, I know I know those are outdated metrics, but like that means that like everybody that you were looking at looked a little bit like non the way that they were supposed to look. Greenish or purplish. Or... And you can see it in like movies that are shot with like old LEDs. Like people kind of look a little zombie, you know? And then you think about the people that work in offices that have those lights, and I'm just like, oh, we have accepted. Yeah, so that, that's just like uh, hmm. hi-fi where you buy a superior system, but you buy crappy cables and it sounds, it doesn't sound as good. Yes. There's two things here. There's the LED itself that creates the light, the lighting, and then there's the camera that sucks it up. So it's like, I see these people over and over again talking about camera color science. I'm like, yes, it's important. And yes, you're going to shoot in daylight all the time. But like, if you're not investing in good lighting, the, the, the source, the way that people look inherently from the from the jump is gonna look bad so again I tell this to my team as a motivational thing too because it's like um, I think I think about the people that work in offices that don't have high quality lighting and it's like you are literally seeing people like a little skewed yeah a little this more zombie our brain comes in right but the camera doesn't have our brain to compensate yes, yes. so then yes. I think so that like, given that spectacular intro I think what everybody yeah. wants to know is sure. when we will see ProLeft tech going into Aperture products. Absolutely. So again, the technical teams have just started working together. So this is not a product launch. It's going to take some time, okay? But uh, a couple of announcements that we can make today. One, we have already been able to combine the ProLite color mixing algorithm and the RGB ACL technology with what we've done in RGBWW for spectral fidelity. We have already announced the ProLite Plus Color Engine, which is basically using all the developments that they've made plus our developments together. Uh, this is not RGBWW, not RGBACL. Um, I don't want to even talk really about the letters, to be honest, because I don't know the letters really matter. The point is you're getting uh, the color finesse of RGBACL, you're getting the brightness and the white point of RGBWW. So, and Will that yeah. be dropped as a firmware update or will be that this integrated is, into new products? Yes, where, this is the new color engine it? that's going to be coming out for all products in the future. Um, it's gonna take a minute for us to be able to put that engine into the products, but we just wanted to announce that. Number two, for everyone that has ProLite products out there, uh, Sidus Link is going to be available for all of them as well too. That's amazing. We're super excited about that. So again, for people that don't know what Sidus Link is, it's um, it's really it, it's it's the most powerful aperture lighting ecosystem, and now ProLite customers get that as well. Will that work the other way around? So if, for example, if I were using Promolink. Uh... Promolink. Uh, Chromalink? They're, they're up, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Chromalink and, you know, also it, like yeah. things like uh, mm. the Simo integration, sure. where you can create on-the-go yeah. uh, scenic lighting. Absolutely. Uh, so basically, as far as the features go, yes, we're already looking into those, and we're actually going to be porting over a lot of the features from Chromalink. Uh, as far as the actual control of Chromalink to aperture lights, no, we cannot do that yet. However, it will go one way. So, again, if, you, if there's a feature that you're missing in Chromalink that you want us to incorporate, just find us on the user groups. You know, we're not hard to find. You know, people tag their dog online. They say, at Ted, is, is my dog cute? You know, like, you can find us online. We're pretty much there everywhere. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing from Aperture is that your, your lights are getting bigger and bigger. I mean, the, they are. the, the XT26 that we're seeing right there, yeah. that, that, you know, in some country, it takes a three-phase uh, power yeah. socket to power. Yep. Then on the other hand, we're seeing small lights like the MC series. Yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering, how are you juggling are we thinking about lighting this? for filmmakers and studios yeah. while you're still doing content lighting creators. for small content creator, yeah. small crews, even like, you know, the single person who's just raising their phone. Yeah. And then how does Aperture yeah. see the market? Okay, well, I'm going to ask for your opinion, too, because I highly respect Udi's opinion on this matter in particular. In particular, this is a great one. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So my feeling is, is that 
Okay, well, there's two things that have happened. One is that Aperture, we used to be known in the beginning as like just the affordable lighting solution. The thing that put us on the map, to be honest, was literally our LED color science was really good because we had our CTO that came from Fujifilm, right? And he was obsessed with color science and we were able to do that affordably. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, usually you have to pay a lot of money for high quality LEDs. In the beginning, it was like an affordability thing. Now it's people look at us. I also remember it, that the 120 was not an affordability thing. It was an innovation That product. was like, it, there was nothing like yes. this before. I agree. And there was the 120. I agree, I agree. I think bit by bit, the industry has changed in the way that they look at Aperture. Now they look at Aperture and they're saying, how are you changing the industry? Oh, that is a really crazy realization to wake up to one day, which is like, oh, we are now responsible for pushing LED forward, which means that well, no weight to get on your shoulders at all. We enjoy it. We <laughs> like it. And we're, we're very honored and proud and happy to be that. Um, what that means, though, is that we now have to think bigger in terms of not just what do the content creators need, but it's also what does the high end need. And they've got a laundry list. And I talk to people every day, and they write comments, and they complain about everything, and I see it. And thank you for writing those comments. Uh, it's our job to solve those things. On the content creator side, I also think that they've been dealing with a lot of problems as well, too. And, and this is my question that I want to ask you. <laughs> Tell me if this is right, because I'm not sure, but I, I, I feel certain about it, but are, I want your opinion. Are you hijacking this interview, Tad? I just want to hear your thoughts <laughs> on it, too. My question is, is um, I feel like for a long period of time, all online content creators, they have been forced to use tools for indie filmmakers and that no one has really been designing things like specially for the content creator. And here's how I'm gonna define it. If you think about like podcasters, Twitch streamers, YouTubers, and now TikTokers, there was a time where all of them were content with using the same tools that like videographers were using and like small news stations and stuff like that. And that's just because it was the most affordable thing that could do video production. It was also the, almost the only thing available. It was the only thing available. But if you think about it, like what a videographer is doing and what a wedding filmmaker is doing, totally different than what like a Twitch streamer is doing, right? Like a Twitch streamer never moves. They're in the same place every day. They want to be able to control their light with like their desktop and stuff like that. So if you think about it, actually the content creator community, I, I, again, I know the high end of filmmaking is like, we don't need to care about, no, 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 no I feel bad for them. <laughs> Because they have to go out and they have to learn all this broadcast stuff and like, you know. They for have you to and, haul stuff, they have cases. Yes, and they have to use all this stuff that was not designed for them at all. So I think uh, that's the big thing that we're seeing here today. Right over here is the Amaran booth. This is the Aperture booth. So the way that we're thinking about it is there's indie filmmakers and high-end filmmakers and both of them, they care about like the broadcast way of doing things. They care about film sets and location shoots and virtual production and like, even if people haven't made it to that stage yet, our goal is, can we make the F1 of filmmaking, right? Like the, the stuff that like the most creative demanding minds out there want, like gravity, that's, like. That's the track they're on. That's right? the track that they're on. And then there's people that are earlier on that stage of that track. And maybe, maybe they don't have the budget yet, or maybe they don't have the crew yet to do that, but they still want to work in that way. So then we have two goals. One is like, can we be the F1 of filmmaking and like help the highest minds out there? But then can we also make sure to remember to leave the door open? for the indie filmmakers, and how can we give the most value to them? That's Aperture, those two things. F1 and then value for the indie filmmaker. On the Amaran side of things, our big thing is, there's a person out there, you know, uh, Mr. Beast uses some of our lights now, right? He is an amazing content creator. Never wants to be Roger Deakins. Never wants to be sitting on the dolly with the camera, right? So he's got a totally different way of working. But he also needs tools that are insanely demanding and tools that can do insanely like difficult things. That guy is shooting 24 seven, he's got crews. They work in a different way. So our goal is, can you make something for the content creator? Again, the F1 of content creation, it's a different world. But then also make something affordable for the indie content creators out there. Because again, if you're making like a baking channel. That was, when, so how about that third big segment that is, yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're not doing what you would define as, a, as a, a storytelling in the sense that there, you know, there's no set, there's no, 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 no Why should they be forced? You know, sitting in front of a computer yeah. or maybe sitting in a restaurant. Totally. Why should those maybe people be forced? Yes. Why should the person that wants to, that, like, okay, there's a person out there that is a, a bread genius. 
knows everything about bread and wants to share the bread secrets with the rest of the world. Why does that person also need to learn filmmaking? That person should just be thinking about bread all day long. So then our goal for that person is how can you make the tool that is so easy to use, that's so intuitive to use, that that bread genius can focus on bread and then broadcast that to the rest of the world. So be before the chat, we had yeah. a little conversation. Yes. And, and now I wonder, like, is this going to be via hardware? Are you yeah. looking into software? So what do you think the future looks like? What do you think it looks like? <laughs> Tell me your thoughts and I'll I tell you think, mine. Yeah. I think yes. that if you want to be an easy tool for uh, that segment, mm -hmm. you have to dive into software and software tools. I agree. I agree. I think it's got to be a mix of both. Software can do so many things, as we're seeing right now, as we can see with you know, generative AI, we can see all these things. You can, again, I was talking to a company the other day that was talking about, um, you, know, you can switch out backgrounds now, you can now place people that they look realistic in the photo. Um, you were talking about if we shoot a wedding, just surround the wedding with cameras and then find what you need in post. I agree, I think all that stuff's coming. But until software can do everything, right? Until the digital world is all that exists, right? <laughs> Our and the physical, the yes, I agree, yes, until the digital world is all that exists. <laughs> Just like the physical world, the digital world has limitations. And the physical world then needs to meet those limitations, and that's hardware. Until the lighting of the digital world is able to reach the level of perfection that the most wor demanding world cinematographer needs, we're still shooting in the physical world, baby. We're still in the physical world, then. Until the world's greatest creative mind out there needs that, we're still in the physical world. Okay. So it's not just software, it's hardware. The two have to be married. And that's the problem that the software companies are doing. That's the problem that the hardware companies are doing. We're trying to do both. Yeah, this is I'm really curious to see where this is going. I got a lot of ideas. I got, a, also I got a lot of the ideas. Fact that you yeah. sure. so much, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I shared a lot. This. What are you talking? I'm mean, yapping all day. What are you talking I about? I'm talking about the physical world uh, here at IBC. You know, everywhere that you go, you're seeing uh, either a new lighting company, yeah. or you know, you're seeing a uh, an existing company picking up lights. Yeah. Um, how does Aperture distinguish yeah. themselves from all those gazillion companies who are sure. doing lighting? I mean, first off, it's an honor. You'd have to say, well, thank you, you know? Like, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Really, when you see other companies doing what you're doing, you're like, wow, we must have really done a good job at supplying something that people really needed. And then two, it's so good that other people want to do it. That's fantastic. I think, here's, I, I got two things here. One is that uh, it's like a technical team thing, too. I, there's some jokes online right now with the product announcement. Uh, a lot of people have been writing like, Aperture has now assembled the Avengers of film lighting, <laughs> right? And I'm like looking at these like photos that people have been editing of like our team together. Oh, hilarious, right? But I, but I really mean that in terms of how can you build a, a company and a culture where when you're the best at what you do, you come join us at Aperture. <laughs> That's the goal. So I, I, That is the guy. You want to come hang out? Yeah, Udi, you going to hang out? There you go. So, I, uh, I got to ask though, so who do you do consider yeah. your competition in sure. this environment? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't want to say names. Come on. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'll just I'm say the, like, like, there's, the, the there's the obvious ones out there. There's the, there's the big lighting companies that have been there for like, what? Like, I think most of the big lighting companies out there have been out there for at least 100 years. Right? Most of them have. And um, look, there's like a t it's a two-sided thing with this. One is that I respect the history of where these companies have come from. And frankly, I'm in awe that, they're, that they are considering us as their competitor now. Aperture, we're not even 10 years old yet. And I think there's like excitement, and like the team knows this, right? Like, I, you know, for any team that's watching this right now, you guys know, things are crazy. We're changing every day. We're working on all these things. New people are coming to join the team, right? We just got, with, with Mitch joining the team now, we have, I think the world's best, undisputed best color science on the team. We have Tim Kang on the team, who's the head of the ASC Lighting Committee. Like, we were, when we were in the basement, it was not this, right? It was a very different team, right? And, um, you know, like Ben Dynas, who's like the lighting console programmer for like the Jungle, Jungle Book and stuff is back there now, working on all of our lighting control. It's a different company. Um, for competitors, I'm not worried because I think we've established a reputation that when you're the best at what you do in film lighting, you come join Aperture. That is what I care about. Um, number two, uh, I think the way and like the culture that our team works in terms of like 
We're super engaged with the user. Again, people know you can post a photo of your dog on the user group and tag me. Like we are listening, we're there. We're not just observing from some tower. Oh, that looks cute. No, we're all filmmakers. We know what it's like, we're passionate about it and we're listening to you. Um, and then after that, it's just a lot of hard work. <laughs> It's so let, let me ask you this, and I think yeah. you, you've touched on this, that, sure. you know, yeah. being a, a garage or a basement company is one yeah. thing, and being, you know, this <laughs> is, what are the biggest yeah. challenges that you have yeah. today as the president of Aperture, sure. um, yeah. you know, running this operation? Well, first of all, I'm not alone. It's a team operation. This has always been a team effort, right? Uh, there's a team of three founders. It's uh, me, Ian, and Helm, again, so there's a lot of ball passing here and a lot of people working on different things. Um, less than 10 years, I would say the key to making it work is it's just teamwork. I know it's such a corny answer, but it's like, I really think the, the one thing that I like about these like memes that people are saying about like Avengers of Light and something like that is like, everyone has a superpower. And it's like, how do you make sure that the person that has the superpower is in the place where they can run? And it's not a bunch of people like micromanaging. No, 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 it's like, you are good at what you do, go. And we're gonna get out of your way and he's really good at this and he's gonna go run in this direction. Um, changes, things that are hard, communication. You got a bunch of people that are really good at what they do, they're running at something. Sometimes you get double work on these things. You're like, oh no, you were working on this, but he was working on this, it's difficult, right? Communication, collaboration, and it's also like, like you gotta be really, you gotta be really blunt about it and say like, all the world's best talent does not exist in one location. No, it's a, it's a global thing. I don't care where you are in the world. I just met a kid, uh, I just met a kid in, 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 in Madagascar in like a remote village who I'm talking to and I'm like, this kid is a genius, he's a genius. Come to Aperture. He's never touched a camera before, he's a genius. And I was like, this dude's brilliant. Uh, and it's like, I, I feel grateful that we exist in this time where it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, the internet is a thing, right? Physical world has limitations. The digital world also has limitations, but it's got some benefits. And um, how do you leverage the tools that exist today to be the most global, dynamic team of high level town? Oh, so many corny words coming out of my mouth. Okay, anyways. That's okay. You know, yeah. they're, they're, they're cliches because they're true. I think they're true. Yeah, I think they're true. So. Um, Ted, thank you so much. Before it's a pleasure. we wrap up, I want yeah. to do a quick lightning round. So, oh lighter question, maybe just to get to know you a oh, little better. Oh my goodness. Oh no, I don't know if I can answer these. We'll see. No wrong answers. Okay. While Aperture was speaking, you took a little time off and went back to college. Research. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you had one tip to yeah. give to anyone who's now considering going to college, oh. what would it be? Um, don't let people tell you that you don't know enough to get started. I'll take it. That sounds like a good tip. There's a lot. No, 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 no. Seriously, the experience is amazing because it will let you know what you need to do in the future. But also not knowing is a superpower too. And just run. It's, it's a fresh set of eyes. You know, you're an entrepreneur as well too. You just go, start. Whatever you want to do. Yes, you can. Yes, there's a million things that you don't know, but just get started. Just get okay. started. Um, if everything goes well, yeah. what problem will Aperture try to be solving in five years? Uh, give the world creative superpowers. Make anything you want at any time, and it looks beautiful exactly the way you want it to look. That's a lofty goal. No, I'll try my best. <laughs> <laughs> um, last question. If you were not in the lighting industry, or in the filmmaking industry, oh, sure. where would you be? Yeah, I, I'm very lucky to be in this industry because this industry changes so fast and I am someone that gets bored very quickly. <laughs> so I'm grateful that this industry changes so fast. Uh, where would I be if I wasn't in this industry? It's uh, a darky answer. Uh, geology? I like the planet. I think it's cool. To be interested in film is to be interested in people. And to be interested in geology is to be interested in the planet and time. Yeah, it's just being interested in two different types of storytelling. Yeah. Ted, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for being I'm here. super curious to see yeah. where Aperture is going. Yeah. And, uh, Me too. We'll, 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 we'll <laughs> talk to you again next week. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Judy. Appreciate it. Hey, guys. Thank you.